Sufism is not a philosophy can be lived. Sufis use parables as one of the unique way of explaining the deeper aspects that cannot be said. Lao Tse says, Tao that can be expressed is not Tao. The word water is not water. So in order to know what water is like, what are its qualities, experience has to be there. You have to give in the experience of that which is, only then you know this is water. This is a dialogue between the Sufi mystic Sima and noble man of the time, Mulaka. All these dialogues, sayings are preserved as oral transmission and they become a part of Sufi teaching. Mulakav inquired, tell me something of your philosophy so that I may understand. It is a relevant question as far as philosophy is concerned. It seems this is the problem with the philosophers. They think that by telling something one can understand. We believe in words as if the word itself is the truth, as if the letter is the spirit, but it is not. We have been reared on words. All that we know is words. So naturally the seeker comes to the master, the sheikh, the mystic and asks, tell me something of your philosophy. Similar things happen with different masters. A philosopher came to Buddha and inquired, what is your way? A philosopher came to Hazrat Ubaidullah and inquired a similar question. The master is a state of awareness. When he answers, you can find a similarity in the answers of the masters beyond time and space. And the seekers are reared on the words. They ask philosophical questions. Remember, Sufism is not a philosophy in any way. It is a way of life. It cannot be told. You can live it. You can be it. You can experience it, but it cannot be told. And it is not that Sufism has not tried to tell it. They have to they have tried to tell in many ways, but it goes on slipping. And they will agree with Lao Tse when he says the Tao is the word that Lao Tse uses. Tao that can be said is no more Tao. The truth that can be uttered has already become a lie. The moment you said water, it has become a lie because the water that is existential and the word water are two different things. You will have no experience on your own. Man continues to imitate. So entirely imitative he is that he just imitates other people's words, their philosophy and beliefs. Just watch your mind, what you have got. Is there anything original? No thought is yours. All thoughts are borrowed. Anything that is authentically yours, you will not find. You just go on repeating what others are saying. Drop this repetitiveness. Then the door opens to experience. Philosophy is not going to help. Only insights into your being will help. I have heard an elderly lady had a parrot and that used to use very offensive language. Each time the lady would come into the room, the parrot would say, I wish she was dead. I wish she was dead. She told her pastor about it and he said, "Have a, I have a parrot too, but it is never rude. Bring your parrot over and leave it for several weeks and maybe it will take my parrot's good behavior. She did so. Returning for it after a time, she opened the door and walked in. The lady's parrot said, I wish 
she was dead. Then the minister's parrot chimed in and said, Lord, grant her request. Even parrots are not like parrot-like men. Man is more of a parrot than the so-called parrots. And if parrots repeat and imitate, they can be pardoned, forgiven. But man cannot be forgiven. Never forgive yourself for imitativeness, otherwise you will remain just an imitator. Stop forgiving yourself for imitativeness. Let imitativeness, let imitativeness be the original sin. And when I say original sin, I mean it. This is the only sin. The word sin is very beautiful. It means that which separates. But it is used in a very wrong sense. Sin means that which separates. If you are imitative, you will remain separate from your real self. You are not exploring your real self. And if you are imitative, you will remain separate from God. Because only your original self can have a meeting with that which we call God. But this false, this pseudo mask cannot have any encounter with that which is. False cannot encounter the real. Only the real can encounter the real. Mulaka inquired, tell me something of your philosophy so that I may understand. The mystic replied, you cannot understand unless you experience. Understanding is a byproduct of experience. It is the shadow of experience. When you experience something, you understand it. It is not a pre-requirement. It is the consequence. Understanding is the consequence of experience. You need not have understanding to experience. Just reverse is the case. You need experience to understand something. You cannot understand unless you have experience. And God is not a hypothesis. God is not a speculation. It is not that we think God is. God is whether we think or not. You can go on denying God, but that does not make any difference. God is still is. God is existent. Whether you believe or disbelieve, that does not matter. That has no effect on reality. Your belief, your disbelief, nothing is going to change that which is. So what is the point of belief or disbelief? This is a chair, whether you believe it or not. You can argue that I do not believe that this is a chair. The other can argue, I believe this is a chair. And there can be a heated argument between the two. But the reality of the chair remains unaffected of the two. Drop both belief and disbelief. And then you can see whatsoever is the case. When that has been looked into, a different kind of understanding dawns. This is what Sufi mystic Simak say. But Mulakab said, I do not understand to know. I do not need to have to understand a cake to know whether it is bad. He is using a logic. I do not have to understand a cake to know whether it is bad. It is very logical. In life, you need not experience many things. You still feel that you need. But the same logic cannot be extended towards God. In life, you are living with sleepy people who function through their belief systems. If you follow their belief, you will have a convenient life. Your belief will help you to remain un remain comfortable and convenient. But with God, you are not searching for convenience or security or safety. With God, you are hankering on truth. And this is what is very important. If you want to know the truth, you need not have anything between you and the truth. If you believe or disbelieve, you remain distant. There is something between you and truth and that is your belief or your disbelief. So never allow anything to come between you 
you have to remove all the furniture, the furniture of the mind. You have just to see. Your eyes have to be completely unclouded. Sima, if you are looking at good fish and you think it is a bad cake, you need to understand less. Because your understanding is wrong, basically wrong, it is upside down. It is a fish and you think it is a bad key. Your knowledge is not going to help as far as inward journey is concerned. You have to drop all that you have known by now. It is better that you have less knowledge. No knowledge will be the most perfect thing. Then there is nothing to distract you from the truth. All knowledge distracts when you know it interferes. Hence, one has to be innocent. When someone asks Jesus who can enter the kingdom of your father, he said one who is childlike. He did not say one who is childish. Childlike refers to a different kind of innocence. Only innocent ones know because those who think they know are already corrupted by knowledge. You need to understand less and to understand it better. Now the word understanding is being used in two different senses. You need to understand less and to understand it better. The word is used in two senses. One in the sense of knowledge. The first one you need to understand less. Means you have, this is used in the sense of knowledge. And when it says, and to understand it better, here the word understand is used to explain meditation. One in the sense of intellectuality and the other in the sense of intelligence. First is used as intellectuality, the other as intelligence. The English word meditation comes from the Sanskrit root medha. Medha means intelligence. In fact, it would be more correct to call meditation rather than meditation because meditation has a wrong connotation in the Western mind. It appears as if you are thinking about something, meditating upon it and it is said meditate over this parable. Note, to bring it closer to home, it is better to use the word meditation. Meda means intelligence, not thinking about something, just being intelligent, alert, aware, pure and innocent. That is the essence of meditation. Intelligence, alertness, awareness, purity and innocence. When you do not have knowledge, you know. When you have knowledge, your eyes are covered with smoke and you cannot know. If you are looking at good fish and you think that it is a bad key, you need to understand less and to understand it better more than you need anything else. To understand it better, you need meditation. You have to discard the knowledge so that you can understand less. This is important, the word Simap uses this word understand in two senses. First, as intellectuality, when he says you need to understand less, it refers to intellectuality, your words, your philosophy, your thinking. And when he says to understand it better, it refers to experience, it refers to meditation. Now the seeker wants to know more about Sufi philosophy and the mystic says, if you really want to understand more about the Sufi philosophy, it will be good if you do not know anything at all. Your inner screen is empty and you just come with that state of mind that we call not knowing. No preconceived ideas. Mulaka, then why do you not abandon books and talks if experience is the necessity. That is how the mind goes on. Either or. Logical mind is always divided into either or or. It does not know how to connect the opposite polarities. 
it does not know how to use the word and and both. Remember I had in one of the talks explained books and the talks are important because they teach the outer dimension of the inner. They give you a taste of inner. First Mulaka wants to know about the philosophy, the Sufi philosophy. Then because he is saying there is no philosophy, there is only experience. Mulaka moves to the other extreme. If not this, then the other. Then he says, and why do you not abandon the books and talks? Why do you go on having the talks on a day-to-day -day basis? If experience is all that necessary. When a talk is there, it helps in two ways. First, it brings a deeper understanding and also whatever you have experienced in the state of meditation, it consolidates that. It gives an explanation of what has happened in the state of Marabha. Many people come and they say the similar things. You go on saying that it is, that it cannot be said. Truth is that which cannot be said. Then why are you going? Why you go on speaking again and again? You go on repeating the same thing again and again in many ways then there is no need of talks. That is very logical. Either talk with condition that through the talk, truth can be understood, or do not talk at all. But both are absurd positions. A master has to talk in such a way that he makes you aware that talk is not going to help. The master has to use words in such a way that you do not get entangled with words. The master has to explain so many things to you that you and to simultaneously keep you alert so you do not get caught up in explanation. The master has to use the mind to relate to you because you exist in the mind and there is no other way to relate to you. But he has to keep you alert. He has to keep on reminding you again and again that this is not the whole thing. This is the beginning. This is just the beginning. And that is not even the real thing. The real is yet to come. He has to keep you alert so that you can move, move from world to worldliness, move from world to wordlessness, from theories to truth, from philosophy to experience. A moment comes when master can be silent, utterly silent. But that is possible only when the disciple has come to relate to the master in a totally different way, connected through the heart. Even when Buddha was alive and when thousands of disciples, monks were there, when he kept silent one day, only one disciple, Mahakashyap, understood it. All the other disciples could not decipher the silence of Buddha. And that day Buddha said, I have spoken all that could be spoken, yet still the truth remains unspoken. And today I have given it to Mahakasya, all that which cannot be spoken. That is the beginning of Zen Buddhism. It is said of one of the Zen masters, Hoensha, that one day he was about to preach a sermon when a bird began to sing nearby. He remained silent, pointed to the bird and left. Later on he said he could not have improved upon what the bird was singing. That is why he remained silent. The bird was saying the same truth that he was going to say and in a far superior way. But I do not know what happened to the disciple whether anybody understood it, whether anybody got the message or not. Even with Buddha, only Mahakashyap smiled when Buddha kept silent and looked at the lotus flower that he had brought that morning in his hand. All were anxious to hear the words and he was not speaking, not speaking at all. And then Mahakashyap laughed and Buddha called him and gave him the lotus flower and said to the other disciple, that which can be 
said through words i have said to you and that which cannot be said through words i have given to makasha when i used to sleep at the bed of my grandfather sheikh braj mohalla he did not speak to me there was no words no communication but there was a communion i could not understand any word at that time so how was the communion it was the silent communion he did not say anything i did not ask anything yet still the transmission completed and happened in that moment just a look just a look of the beloved communicates everything no word is needed yes there is something beyond words but you have to be prepared for that only through the words for that so in my case that communion happened with the silence first words came later when i am speaking to you words comes first and then that is followed by a silence sometimes this silence can be of a short period of time but it always comes you have to be aware that the silence is descending now when you listen to these talks afterwards it creates a moment or two of silence within you but it is a logical fallacy that happens the logical minds believes that either everything is possible through word or nothing is possible through the words i have heard of yudhi menhin he was a hasid master a disciple of holy yudhi has taken upon himself the disi- discipline of silence and for 3 years he had not spoken a word save those of tora and prayer yudhi sent for him and said young man how is that i do not see a word of yours in the world of truth yodi was one of these hasid master when the young man justified himself by speaking of the vanity of his speech yodi replied he who only learns and prays is murdering the word of his own soul whatever you have to say can be vanity or it can be true listen to it again yodi said whatever you have to say can be vanity or it can be truth come to me after the evening prayer and i shall teach you how to talk real words are not vain vain and vain words are not real yes that is the reality two words too it is not ultimate it only indicates it is indicating it is like a gesture when i am pointing to the moon with my finger my finger is not moon do not mistake it and do not start clinging to my finger that it is the moon it is pointing no don't move to the other extreme if the finger is not the moon then how can you indicate the moon by finger that is the absurdity again either you cling to the finger because you say you are showing the finger or you say then you don't show the finger finger is not moon but moon can be indicated by finger finger is not moon word can become indicative they are gestures the one that i spoke of yodi he was a hasid master not the modern musician you the man who mula ka then why do you not abandon books and talks if experience is necessary sima because the outward is the conductor to inward books will teach you something of the outer dimension of the inward so to the talks of the sheikhs will teach you the outward dimension of the inward and without these books or talks you will not make any progress remember the outward and inward are not different the outward is also a part of the inward look at the coconut it has a inner aspect and the outer 
when the coconut is young the inner aspect the gel remains attached to the outer and you cannot separate it it remains stick to the outer but as it matures as the coconut matures the inner and outer become separate and then you can remove the inner from the outer discard the outer and keep the inner intact that is why in the market you see the whole inner kernel of the coconut when the coconut is young you have to scrape the kernel from the shell in order to get it and yet still you cannot get the whole kernel they are connected to one another the outward is also a part of inward the outermost part and the inward is also a part of the outward it is the inward or the innermost part but they are not separate they are together never separate them they are one reality just like the circumference and the center without the center the circumference cannot exist and center always exists with circumference otherwise it is not called a center you can have a point on a piece of paper it will not be called center unless there is a circumference so both circumference and center go together they are meaningful in their togetherness the center cannot exist without circumference and circumference cannot exist without center if circumference is there without a center it cannot be called a circumference and if the center is there without circumference it will not be called center instead a point it is not the center any more of what the center always depends on circumference this is here less understanding but understanding in a better way the surface is the part of the depth and depth is the part of the surface and this is the right understanding because the outward is the conductor to the inward many times it happens and they want to learn something but they use their logical mind the inside hunger is fulfilled by outside food because outside is constantly changing into inside when you eat you chew you digest it becomes the inside the food that was outside becomes inside and what is inside is constantly becoming your outside life is changing always moving from inside to outside and from outside to inside it is a tremendous movement between polarities just when you love a man or a woman you divide the outer and inner you say i will not touch your body because i love you from inside what is the point of touching your body i love you but i hate your body have you said this to any woman at the same time i love you but i hate your body she will never forgive you have you ever said something like this to a man i love you tremendously but don't touch me do not make any outward show what is the point of hugging or embracing you there is no need. we can love as inner center but is that love going to grow is that love going to fulfill is that love going to become commitment it's not possible mystic said because the outward is the conductor to the inward books will teach you something of the outward aspect of the inward and so will the talks with them without them you will not make any progress mulaka but why should we not be able to do so or attain to this state without books or to again logic wants to be consistent and life is not consistent logic says if books are not needed then they are not needed then why can't we do without books then why don't you be consistent why are you not consistent either say books are useless and burn them or say they are useful and worship them but a man who understands life is not 
an extremist. He says books can be used, but there is no need to worship them. Just as, but it happens we understand this. Books are necessary, but they cannot be worshipped. When Hindus use idols, they can be used as symbols. Just as books are symbols, idols are symbols, but there is no need to worship them. Books can be used or anything for that matter that can be used as a symbol is of great assistance, but there is no need to burn them and at the same time there is no need to worship them. Sufis will not agree with the Zen masters of burning the scriptures because when you burn the scriptures it shows you are still too much attached to them. Otherwise why burn them? Why take so much trouble? You have some attachment, some obsession. Either you can worship or you can burn. But you cannot just use them. Sufis are more down to earth people. People simply jump from one extreme to another. The logic always can be deceptive. You believe it, logic can deceive you because it pretends a kind of consistency. It is very self-fulfilling. It creates a very consistent world of concepts. If you decide that the scriptures are useful, then logic says worship them. It is a logical, it is very logical. Place them on high pedestal, they are true, embodied true. Or if you can say truth is not in words, then the scriptures are meaningless. Then throw them away, burn them, either worship or insult them. But the really practical man, one who is pragmatic, will use them. He will neither worship nor insult them because both are, whether you worship it or insult, both are and both are attitude of emotions. You do not worship a timetable and you do not burn it either. You simply use it. All the scriptures are timetables for inward change. They are not the inner journey. Remember, they are maps. The map of India or the map of United States of America is not the country. Seeing the map of USA or India, you have not visited that country. But there is no need to burn it because it is not the country. It can be helpful. It can be of tremendous help. It can bring you to the real country. And a road map is a must when you are traveling in a strange land. The scriptures are like road maps. A road map contains many things except one thing, how to hold it. It can be used and that is the pragmatic standpoint, Mulaka. But why should we not be able to do without books, Sima? The logic continues to say the same thing in many different ways. For the re same reason that you cannot think without words, you have been reared on books, your mind is so altered by books and talks, by hearing and speaking, that the inward can only speak to you through the outward, whether whatever you pretend, you can perceive. We have been reared on words and books, mind is nothing else but words logic, philosophy. If mind has to be converted, then it has to be approached in a way that it can understand. Hence the masters use books, they write books, they use even logic. Masters use all of them as road maps. But their whole effort is take you beyond yourself. They use words to go beyond words. They use mind to drop it, to become mindless, to become a state of no mind, to reach to the inner space that you are. Mulaka, does this apply to everyone? Again, this is logic trying to find consistency. Does this apply to everyone? Logic always generalizes and reality is not a generalization. Unique 
individuals are here there are no generalizations have you ever seen a human being you see different people you will never come across a human being you will always come across concrete men and women but not human beings concrete logic lives in generalization mulakab ask does this apply to everyone sima replied it applies to whom it applies it applies above all to those who think it does not apply to them if you think it does not apply to you certainly it applies to you it is of tremendous importance keep it always in your consciousness it applies above all to those who think it does not apply to them the whole effort of krishna murti he says that i am nobody's master and nobody is my master those who were egoistic they stick to krishna murti because the last deception the mind can play that is the last trick the strategy of the mind to protect itself it applies to all but it does not apply to me you always become a victim of that trick it does not apply to me it may apply to x y and z but not to me i have heard a man who used to come to a church to listen to a priest and every day whenever he was leaving he would say to the priest you did well you hammered well all those people needed it by and by it became a kind of drag to the priest the man was so egoistic it was an everyday thing whenever the priest will speak in the end the man was waiting and would say you did well you hammered well all these people needed it they deserved it you put them right that is going to help them and the priest was waiting for the right opportunity to speak to this man then one day it happened it was raining hard and only this man turned up nobody else was there so the priest told now let us see what he says and the man was waiting when the priest finished the man was going out and he said you did well they would have been benefited very much if they had been there poor fellows they missed i feel sorry for them remember that all that is being said by the masters is said to you remember what the man said when there was there used to be people he said you hammered them well they needed this they deserved this and it will tremendously help them when it was raining and there was no one he said you did well they would have been benefited if they were here poor fellows they missed and i feel sorry for them this is how the mind goes remember all that is said by the master is for you i used to observe the words of masters very minutely and all the message that was said the message was given related to me and me alone the moment that understanding comes to you the process of transformation begins whatever master is saying he is addressing me and me alone although you are part of the crowd but master speaks to the individuals not to the crowd and if you feel that it does not apply to you then it applies to you certainly and absolutely whenever you want to make an exception of yourself be aware you are being fooled by your mind beware and escape from that trap and if you are aware and you can escape from that trap you are an you become an exception by not thinking you are the exception you can become the exception by not thinking that you are great you can become great by not thinking that you are great you can become great by not thinking that you are very humble you can become humble all that is good this is innocent this is the way of the master master speaks to the individuals amidst the crowd there may be many people in the congregation but master addresses 